Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 270, recorded on December 7th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start this week in the kernel corner, with updates to several projects at the center of our lives. First up is news of an early, alpha-quality graphics driver for the Apple M1 and M2 hardware shipping in Asahi Linux. Hmm, that does feel like a bit of a moment for the project. Congratulations to them. And I think you should probably be aware out there, this is really ground-level type stuff here. There is some decent progress, but it's still early days. One of the other exciting aspects of this is it includes some of that experimental Rust-written DRM kernel driver code. That's just kind of noteworthy on its own. And the driver seems to be good enough to run some composited desktops like Plasma, supports GL2 and GLES 2.0 games. So older games, you know, things like the Quake 3 type games are going to work just great. At this stage, though, the driver and its dependencies are only enabled downstream in Asahi Linux proper. But as the driver matures and the mainline kernel's ROS support gets a little better, I have every reason to think that this driver is going to make its way upstream like a lot of the Asahi work already has. Yeah, so that's going to be, you know, a little bit down the road. So as for what is more immediate, lead developer of the graphics driver, Alyssa Rosenwig, says that more open GL support is high on that list just because it means more application support. However, getting to that next echelon is going to take a considerable amount of development effort. Seems to be somewhat the same story for Vulkan. They write, quote, We're working on it. Although we're only shipping OpenGL right now, we're designing with Vulkan in mind. Most of the work we're putting toward OpenGL will be reused for Vulkan. We estimated that we could ship working OpenGL 2 drivers much sooner than a working Vulkan 1.0 driver, and... We wanted to get hardware accelerated desktops into your hands as soon as possible. Well, I can understand that. So sticking with Apple hardware in the kernel corner just for another minute, uh, there's a serious improvement for Apple Silicon with the CPU frequency driver we told you about recently, now in the queue for Linux 6.2. This is going to mean better battery life. And although the support seems quite basic at this point, there's still improvements. And it's only a subset of the idle and sleep state features that are in there, at least in this first series of patches. And lastly, in today's kernel corner, we're pleased to report that the Linux kernel's floppy disk driver is getting an update in 6.2. Uh, turns out, though, that a memory leak snuck in back in Linux 5.11. There were some workarounds, but that leak has now been fixed as part of a poll of some general block driver changes for Linux 6.2. Also, don't worry. It has been marked for backporting to the current stable releases. Popping up the stack a bit, Google has some good news for Android users out there this week. They're reporting that the, quote, number of memory safety vulnerabilities have dropped considerably over the past few years and releases. Specifically, the number of annual memory safety vulnerabilities fell from 223 to 85 between 2019 and 2022. They are now 35% of Android's total vulnerabilities versus 76% just four years ago. In fact, quote, 2022 is the first year where memory safety vulnerabilities do not represent a majority of Android's vulnerabilities. That actually seems like a pretty big deal, right? Going from 223 to 85 uh, and by the way, those numbers, those are coming from the amount of critical or high vulnerabilities that were reported in the Android security bulletins that Google puts out based on how people reported it, you know, through their bug programs and other means. So what's changed? Why is this all of a sudden so much better? Well, Google says it's the adoption of Rust in Android. And in general, they're just putting an emphasis on memory safe languages but now Rust is making up 21% of all new native code in Android 13. Google also seems impressed that zero memory safety vulnerabilities have been discovered in Android's Rust code, at least so far across Android 12 and 13. Now, of course, correlation does not imply causation, and to that point, they tell us, quote, It's interesting to note that the percent of vulnerabilities caused by memory safety seems to correlate rather closely with the development language that's used for new code. 
This matches the expectations published in our blog post two years ago about the age of memory safety vulnerabilities and why our focus should be on new code, not rewriting existing components. I remember that. I remember thinking that's kind of a spicy take. Engineers always want to just build new stuff, but looking back at it, I think they were onto something. It kind of makes sense. If you start cleaning up these low-hanging fruits, and these memory vulnerabilities so typically are like the low-hanging fruit, the attack surface that is available becomes less. And so it just becomes more and more challenging to exploit Android. And there's just something great about that. It's nice to finally have some good security news for Android. Uh, but when you zoom out and take it just beyond Android, doesn't it kind of make you excited for memory-safe languages in Linux in general, and maybe even specifically in the Linux kernel? The Fedora team has officially decided to give the go to produce a mobility Fosh spin. Fosh is that Wayland compositor built by Purism and a bunch of other developers that layers in a bunch of GNOME technologies to create a mobile-focused UI also with a lot of the adaptable UI stuff you're seeing updated in GTK4 applications. And in fact, a lot of the GNOME community is considering it all getting to pretty, a pretty good spot in pretty good condition. And so the Fedora project is going to have a spin now that showcases this with the intended benefit for Fedora being, well, really just exposure to users on mobile hardware and secondarily to give those users an option to use a 100% open source phone interface in vanilla kernels on top of that, which ultimately could be a really big deal. And for you Plasma mobile fans, well, <laughs> don't worry. I know you were hoping this story would be for you, but that is actually getting worked on. It's being packaged up, and it sounds like we'll have an update for Plasma mobile on Fedora soon. In fact, if you want to give any of this a go, see the discussion that took place, or get your hand on some images, we'll have links in the show notes for you. There's a critical stack-based buffer overflow bug we wanted you to be aware of. Sometimes, a giant can be taken down by a mouse. And FreeBSD is that giant this week. The maintainers have released an update to address a critical flaw in ping. It turns out there's a potentially exploitable remote code execution flaw caused by how FreeBSD's ping handles edge cases in some ICMP responses. A remote attacker can trigger the vulnerability, causing the ping program to crash and potentially leading to remote code execution. But here at Linux Action News, we're sure our friends at FreeBSD would never tease Linux about a flaw like this. So we'll refrain from doing so. And just leave you with some good news that's included in the public advisory. Quote, The ping process runs in a capability mode sandbox on all affected versions of FreeBSD and is thus very constrained in how it could interact with the rest of the system at the point where the bug can occur. Linode.com slash LAN. That's where you go to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and it's just a great way to support the show while you're checking out fast, reliable cloud hosting. Linode has the best support in the business and the best performance in the business, and they're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers out there that have all these crazy different options and they try to do too many things with horrible support. And on top of that, Linode has 11 data centers for you to choose from with 12 more coming online next year and great features like S3 compatible object storage, cloud firewalls that block traffic before they even hit your rig, easy to understand, easy to restore, easy to create backups, Kubernetes support, and a lot of documentation. So go build something, go learn something and try it for yourself while you support the show. Go see why everything we've deployed in the last three years, we do it on Linode. And whenever we want something that's fast, reliable, and something our audience is going to use, we deploy it on Linode. Go see why. Linode.com slash LAN. Get that $100 and support the show. Linode.com slash LAN. And thank you to Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful, untapped resource in IT. End users. When you're trying to achieve security goals, whether for a third-party audit or your own compliance standards, the conventional wisdom is to treat every device like Fort Knox. Old-school device management tools like MDMs 
force disruptive agents onto employee devices that slow performance and treat privacy as an afterthought. That way of doing things turns IT admins and end users into enemies and creates its own security problems because users just turn to shadow IT to do their jobs. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes on users, Collide sends them security recommendations via Slack. Collide will automatically notify your team when their devices are insecure and give them step-by-step instructions on how to solve the problem. By reaching out to employees via a friendly Slack DM and educating them about company policies, Collide can help you build a culture in which everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. For IT admins, Collide provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet, whether they're running on Mac, Windows, or yes, Linux. You can see at a glance which employees have their disks encrypted, OS up to date, and password manager installed, making it easy to prove compliance to your auditors, customers, and leadership. So that's Collide, user-centered, cross-platform endpoint security for teams that slack. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Visit collide.com slash LAN to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag, including a t-shirt, just for activating a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. The OpenSUSE Project D installer, their next generation OS installer, reached a notable milestone this week. And they've released a new prototype, and they're asking for your help. That's right. Things are getting to the stage now where they need the community to help test. The OpenSUSE YAS team is the ones developing the D installer, and it can be controlled via a DBus API, a command line interface, or, as most end users will probably use, a modern web front end. It can also run directly on a host system or even execute as a container. And today, as we record, the team has published this new prototype that they say has fixed several bugs that were reported by the previous testers, and they've even included some new features. Uh, Probably the most visible of those is the new screen to configure storage and LVM support. They have a few ways to test it out if you're interested, the most simple being a live ISO image. They admit it might not be the most optimized live image, but it does get you X11, Firefox, and that new web installer up and running in a live session pretty darn quick. You actually gave it a try, right, Chris? Yeah, I gave it a go before the show today, and I decided to do it on an ARM system, no less, because that's an area where they're asking for a little extra testing. And you're an ARM hipster, perhaps? Yeah, you know, whenever I get the opportunity. (laughs) And, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, the ISO is about a gig. So I suppose that's a tad hefty these days, but... I really don't mind. I mean, I'm not using this for production deployments anyways. And so it booted right up and I got to work because I'm guessing just at this stage in the installer, they haven't baked in all like the obnoxious Euless greens and stuff. So you just get boom (laughs) right into the action. And it lets you pick like what version of SUSE you want. You know, they got the micro stuff on there. They got tumbleweed, et cetera. So you pick which one you want and they do a really good job of laying out the information. Like this is your network interface. This is going to be your disk layout. This is going to be the user account and the root status. And then you can click in there and modify things. And all of the information is really identifiable. You don't spend a bunch of time searching for where a button might be or how you edit something like you might in some installers out there. And I think they've done a good job of cleaning it all up so that it seems really kind of like a, I guess I'd say a fresh take on a UI. You know, there's kind of different bars and sometimes installers can seem really old and antiquated. This one seemed really kind of like a modern design. It was nice, too, that I could pull it up on another machine. That's a useful aspect of this, obviously. And at least right now, the installer actually displays your IP at the bottom when you boot on that machine directly. And so you can just grab that IP, go to another system, and it's a cockpit-style URL. And what I mean by that is they're actually using components of cockpit for this. And so you put that into your whatever machine you're at, and it'll pull it up on that remote machine. And the URL structure is pretty easy and it's listed in their documentation. And then you can just get to work from another computer, which is going to be great for headless systems and obviously enterprise uh, deployments. I have to say, I liked it. You know, I was skeptical when I heard of a web-based installer. It worked great. And 
the web version is really just going to be one of many options because of the way they've abstracted all of this. You could see enterprise teams or individual projects building their own interfaces to that Dbus API. An API for your Linux install. Who would have thought? But yeah, I mean, that seems super useful. I'm sure we could come up with use cases for it. Folks to point it at scale certainly could. And it kind of makes every other operating system's installation procedure seem a little old and busted. Now, we should probably let you know if you're testing this on physical hardware, there is an issue that the team is aware of that can lead to long hardware detection times. So just be a little patient if that hits you. It doesn't seem to be an issue if you're testing in a VM. Yeah, and they have an open bug about that already. So so yeah, they are on it. And in the VM, it's it's totally fine. I've, I've experienced that issue before, on at least on ARM hardware. Uh, overall, I think this is something that if you're a SUS fan or if you're curious to see where Linux installers are going, it's worth grabbing that ISO and maybe testing it for them. We're going to do a complete deep dive into OpenSUSE on this coming Sunday's Linux Unplugged. So make sure you catch episode 488, because I think that's going to be pretty interesting. But of course, we'll keep an eye on the development of this and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. So don't miss an episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get each episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. At the end of the year, Jupiter Broadcasting is spinning down its Patreon, and so we have a special deal to join Jupiter.party. That's where you get all the shows ad-free, and it's the only way to get Linux Action News ad-free. Jupiter.party, use the promo code 2022 and take two bucks off your monthly cost. As for this show, well, we'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. That's all the news for this week.